I must admit that I too, among hundreds of millions of educated people, was under the impression that the African slave trade was the sole responsibility of the Christian Europeans, the white race. That is, until I started exploring the subject in greater depth, and especially after reading an incredibly enlightening book called The Legacy of Arab Islam in Africa by John Alambilla Azuma. My whole perspective and understanding has changed dramatically, and I would like you to tell us more about this subject. The success of Mohammedan Islam in deceiving, misinforming, deforming, and contorting both history and reality over a period of almost 1400 years has been astounding. That is, until now. The greatest tragedy about this particular subject is that most of the descendants of African slavery, the black people in the Americas, around the world, as well as among the African blacks, are totally ignorant of the actual facts. Before we lose the concentration of our listeners, I would like to make the following statement and then prove it. That the worst, most inhumane and most diabolical institution of the black African slave trade was initiated, refined, perpetrated and implemented by the Mohammedan Arabs and later aided and abetted by the black converts to Mohammedan Islam. I predict that as usual, the two subcultures, those of denial of facts and of political correctness, will attack us without once disproving a single statement and or conclusion that we make. Slavery was not created by the white races, because it has existed throughout a human history and practiced by every tribe, culture, civilization, racial group and religion. In fact, the very word slavery has its root in the name Slav, based upon the Slavic peoples of Europe who were subjugated by other Europeans. It is not common knowledge that the Arabic word Abd is synonymous with the meaning of slave. For example, Abdullah means literally the slave of Allah, and that in the language of the Arabs, all black peoples are called Abid, plural, for slaves. While much has been written concerning the transatlantic slave trade, Surprisingly, little attention has been paid to the Islamic slave trade across the Sahara, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. While the European involvement in the African transatlantic slave trade to the Americas lasted for just over three centuries, the Arab involvement in the African slave trade has lasted 14 centuries, and in some parts of the Mohammedan world is still continuing to this day. The birth of Mohammedan Islam and its conquests brought about the birth of institutionalized, systematized, and religiously sanctioned slave trade on a massive and global scale. In fact, the Quran allows the taking of slaves as booty or reward for wars of aggression against any and all unbelievers, most of the human population. This has led to an enormous number of so-called holy wars, jihad in Arabic. There was and is absolutely nothing holy about these wars which are primarily to plunder, slaughter, rape, subjugate and rob other human beings of their wealth, produce, freedom and dignity. Mohammedan Muslim states and tribes attacked other non-Muslim groups to achieve these objectives. Although Islamic jurisprudence laid down regulations for the treatment of slaves, however, Incredible and heinous abuses have occurred throughout the history of Muhammadan Islam. By the Middle Ages, the Arab, Arabic word Abid was in general used to denote a black slave, while the word Mamluk referred to a white slave. Ibn Khaldun, 1332-1406, the preeminent Islamic medieval historian and social thinker wrote, The Negro nations are, as a rule, submissive to slavery because they have attributes that are quite similar to dumb animals. It should also be noted that black slaves were castrated based on the assumption that the blacks had an ungovernable sexual appetite. When the Fatimid Caliphate came to power in Egypt, they slaughtered all the tens of thousands of black military slaves and raised an entirely new slave army. Some of these slaves were conscripted into the army at age 10. From Persia, to Egypt, to Morocco, slave armies from 30,000 to up to 250,000 became commonplace. 
the Islamic slave trade took place across the Sahara Desert, from the coast of the Red Sea, and from East Africa across the Indian Ocean. The Trans-Sahara trade was conducted along six major slave routes. Just in the 19th century, for which we have more accurate records, 1.2 million slaves were brought across the Sahara into the Middle East, as well as a further 450,000 down the Red Sea and 442,000 from the East African coastal ports. That is a total of 2 million black slaves just in the 1800s. At least 8 million more were calculated to have died before reaching the Muslim slave markets. A comparison of the Islamic slave trade to the American slave trade reveals some extremely interesting contrasts. While two out of every three slaves shipped across the Atlantic were men, the proportions were reversed in the Islamic slave trade. Two women for every man were enslaved by the Muslims. While the mortality rate of slaves being transported across the Atlantic was as high as 10%, the percentage of slaves dying in transit in the Trans-Sahara and East African slave market was a staggering 80 to 90%. While almost all the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation as concubines, in harems, and for military service. While many children were born to the slaves in the Americas, the millions of their descendants are citizens in Brazil and the United States of today, very few descendants of the slaves that ended up in the Middle East survive. While most slaves who went to the Americas could marry and have families, most of the male slaves destined for the Middle East were castrated and most of the children born to the women were killed at birth. It is estimated that possibly as many as 11 million Africans were transported across the Atlantic, 95% of which went to South and Central America, mainly to Portuguese, Spanish and French possessions. Only 5% of the slaves ended up in what we call the United States today. However, a minimum of 28 million Africans were enslaved in the Muslim Middle East. Since at least 80% of those captured by Muslim slave traders were calculated to have died before reaching the slave markets, it is believed that the death toll from 1400 years of Arab and Muslim slave raids into Africa could have been as high as 112 millions. When added to the number of those sold in the slave markets, the total number of African victims of the Trans-Saharan and East African slave trade could be significantly higher than 140 million people. What is obscene about this whole subject is the Mohammedan Muslim and Arab culture of denial regarding their complicity in the African slave trade, as well as the ignorance of black Muslims about the reality of their past and present conditions. The statistics and reports above are based upon the logbooks kept at the African slave ports, ship logs, travelers' reports, eyewitness accounts, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, the facts and reality of Mohammedan Islam's complicity in the slave trade and their inhuman depravity are infinitely more devastating, more staggering, and more incomprehensible than all the nightmare fictions in the world. In ancient Arabia, poetry was a passion. Poets were highly regarded in society, and the words of many accomplished poets were regarded as next to Allah's words. In a desert land, bereft of much entertainment and natural relaxation, the ancient Arabs used to find solace, peace, tranquility, and even the raging emotion of war and revenge through the mesmerizing words of their poets. Poets supplied the Arabs with their mental and spiritual nourishment since they memorized the ancestry, deeds, glories, and achievements of their tribes and passed them on to future generations through their students or disciples to keep the records alive. Poets were actually the news media par excellence of Arabia. They were lethal weapons since a very capable and articulate poet of a small tribe could elevate it in poems to levels greater than a much more powerful one. As far as our research has demonstrated, no poet in the long period of the so-called Jahiliya period, that is before Muhammad and Islam, was ever murdered for what he or she recited, unlike what was done by Muhammad and his followers. There were more female poets among the Jahiliya Arabs than during the entirety of 1400 years of Muhammad and Islam. Some of these poetesses 
were so formidable that Muhammad had at least two of them assassinated because they satirized him. The following four chapters are actually connected. Since it was Muhammad's aggressive and piratical actions to start with that triggered the responses of some of Arabia's poets. His followers claim that Muhammad is the apostle of peace. As you all know by now, nothing can be further from the truth. These four chapters are just more in our series that are exposing and revealing the very sadistic and cruel nature of Muhammad. We shall prove once more that he was in fact a terrorist, a criminal and a mass murderer whose entire life was based on victimizing innocence and indulging in mindless violence, carnage and massacre. He was a man who destroyed peace wherever he went and in his place brought terror, plunder, rape, carnage and death. When Muhammad first started shouting from the rooftops that he alone had the divine word of Allah, the people of Mecca ignored him. However, when he began insulting and defaming the religion of the peace-loving Meccans, they couldn't take it anymore and tried persuading him to stop. Muhammad the coward was too scared of the growing hostility against him and knowing full well that his Allah could not strike down the Meccans, he crept out one night and fled for his life. Ever since that incident, Muhammad was determined to take revenge on them. He escaped to Medina, which had a sizable Jewish population, and started plotting his revenge with a small gang of criminals. This was the beginning of Muhammad's trail of violence, hatred and bloodshed that would soon destroy all that was decent in the culture of Arabia. The Medina became the headquarters of the first organized crime syndicate in history. As we have shown in several of our chapters, the story has been documented in detail by his Muslim biographers. Surprise raids on trade caravans and tribal settlements. The use of plunder thus obtained for recruiting an even growing army of greedy criminals and desperados. Assassinations of opponents, blackmail, expulsion and massacre of the Jews of Medina, attack and enslavement of the Jews of Khaybar, rape of women and children, sale of these victims after rape trickery, treachery, and bribery employed to their fullest extent to grow the numbers of his version of Islam. He organized no less than 86 expeditions, 26 of which he led himself without participating in the fighting. The motives of the converts to Muhammadan Islam was never in any doubt. D.S. Margolius states in his book, Muhammad and the Rise of Islam, of any moralizing or demoralizing effect that Muhammad's teaching had upon his followers, we cannot say with precision. When he was at the head of the robber community, it is probable that the demoralizing influence began to be felt. It was then that men who had never broken an oath learned that they might evade their obligations, and that men to whom the blood of their clan had been as their own began to shed it with impunity in the cause of Allah, fi sabilullah. That lying and treachery in the cause of Islam received divine approval. It was then too that Muslims began distinguished by the obscenity of their language. It was then too that the coveting of goods and wives possessed by non-Muslims was avowed without discouragement from the Prophet. The details of this criminal onslaughts in the form of piratical skirmishes and assassinations are chronicled in these chapters in a chronological manner. Please note that every time the Apostle of Peace committed one of his criminal acts, he always justified the crime by quickly claiming a divine revelation which conveniently removed the blame from his bloodied hands. These made to order surahs we shall recite after the description of the incident. Believers and unbelievers, be aware of the most important of all facts, that all the reports that we are going to recite to you are one-sided. Since they were written by the victors, the Muhammadan Muslims, no one has any record of the victim's side. Nonetheless, these records show clearly and without pulling any punches the true character of Muhammad and his followers. 1. The massacre of unarmed merchants during the sacred month of Rajab, 623 AD at Nakhla. Four unarmed merchants were traveling to Mecca to sell their goods consisting of resins, honey and animal skins. It was the holy month of Rajab which was considered sacred for trade in Arabia. It was a point of honor that any form of warfare or violence was strictly forbidden in this month. Muhammad's gang attacked the helpless men from behind and stabbed two of them to death. They plundered all the goods as booty and Muhammad got one-fifth of the share. This shows the utter lack of morals or scruples on Muhammad's part. 
the Prophet of Islam did not possess a shred of pity or kindness or the slightest sense of justice. He cold-bloodedly murdered two innocent people who had never done him any harm and did not even know him. All this was done in a month that the Prophet himself declared was a sacred month in which no warfare should take place. Muhammad was obviously motivated by nothing but hatred and greed. Conveniently, divine revelations came down from Allah that absolved him of all the guilt. Al-Baqarah 2.216 Warfare is ordained for you, though it is hateful unto you. But it may happen that you hate a thing which is good for you, and it may happen that you love a thing which is bad for you. Allah knoweth you knew not. Here Muhammad is completely removing all blame from himself for having started the fighting. The most insidious and devilish implication of this verse is that Allah is completely justifying and sanctioning Muhammad's murder of the innocent Meccans. Over and above this, Muhammad is conveniently implying that warfare is hateful to him but that he instigated it because it was ordained by Allah. What moral sacrifices the apostle of peace had to make. Number two, slaughter of the Meccans who came to defend their caravan, March, Ramadan, 623, the well of Badr. The merchandise being carried by this caravan was worth more than 50,000 gold dinars. Muhammad ganged up all the criminals of Medina and set out to raid the caravan with 300 men. The Meccans got word of the raid and sent out an army to protect the caravan. Throughout the entire battle, Muhammad cowered in a hut which his men made for him. There he cried and prayed with feverish anxiety. At one point, he came out of the hut and threw pebbles in the enemy's direction screaming, Let evil look on your faces, and by him who holds my soul in his hands, Anyone who fights for me today will go to paradise. The Muhammadans killed over 200 and took 70 prisoners. All 70 of the prisoners were ransomed and any prisoner who did not fetch a ransom had his head chopped off. Muhammad was gratified at the sight of his murdered victims. After the battle, he sent his followers to look for the corpse of Abu Jahl, one of the Meccans who had criticized him openly. When his corpse was found, they cut off the head and threw it down at Muhammad's feet. The Apostle of Peace cried out in delirious joy, Rejoice! Here lies the head of the enemy of Allah. Praise Allah, for there is no other but he. Muhammad then ordered a great pit to be dug, for the bodies of the innocents to be dumped. The Muslims then proceeded to hack the corpse's limbs into pieces. As the bloodied mass of bodies was being thrown into the pit, a feverishly excited Muhammad shrieked, O oh, people of the pit, have you found that what Allah threatened is now true? For I have found that what my Lord promised was true. Rejoice, all Muslims. One of the prisoners taken was defiant and Nadir ibn al-Harith, who had earlier taken Muhammad's challenge of telling better stories than him. Muhammad ordered Ali to strike off Nadir's head in his presence, so he could watch and exult in the pleasure of beheading the man who had insulted him. Another prisoner Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was decapitated in front of Muhammad. Before being killed, the prisoner cried out pitifully, O oh Prophet, who will look after my children if I should die? The great Prophet of the religion of peace called this spat out hellfire as the blade came down and spattered his clothes with Uqba's blood. This time, Muhammad needed a revelation that would not only absolve him of all the guilt of murdering so many innocent people, but also give him the divine right to get a huge share of the plundered booty. Quite a few revelations magically appeared after the Battle of Badr. Al-Anfal 8.65 O Prophet, exhort the believers to fight. If there be of you 20 steadfast, they will overcome 200, and if there are of you 100, they shall overcome a thousand, because the disbelievers are a folk without intelligence. This surah clearly exposes Islam to be a belief system that not only encourages violence but actually makes it a sacred duty for his followers to kill anyone who does not believe in the Muhammadan version of Islam. Not only is the all-forgiving Allah exhorting his followers to kill anyone who is not a Muhammadan Muslim, but he is also saying that all so-called unbelievers are so stupid that they will be unable to defend themselves and therefore deserve death. Al-Anfal 8.67 It is not for any prophet to have captives until he hath made slaughter in the land. You desire the lure of this world and Allah desires for you the hereafter and Allah is mighty, wise. 
Now, enjoy what you have won as lawful and good, and keep your duty to Allah. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. This verse is in reference to the prisoners that Muhammad held for ransom after the battle. Allah, the merciful, is saying that they should all have been killed. In addition, Allah is conveniently commenting that whatever loot Muhammad has plundered is lawful and good because it was done in the service of Allah. So murder, rape, plunder and destruction are all perfectly fine with Allah as long as they are done in the name of Islam. Muhammad is also assiduously making himself seem very kind for having spared the lives of the prisoners when in fact he only let them live so he could get more money from the ransom for them. In today's world, this is terrorism of the worst kind. 3. Assassination of poets who criticize Muhammad's murderous ways in the Medina. After the Battle of Badr, the people of Medina were horrified that they had given refuge to such a blatant criminal and his followers in their city. Many began protesting the presence of such violent and murderous people in their city. In a free society like pre-Islamic Arabia, the poets acted as society's conscience and were free to criticize, satirize, and examine the actions of people. The two most famous poets of this kind were Abu Afaq, an extremely old and respected poet, and Asma bint Marwan, a young mother with the gift of superb verse. Muhammad was enraged at their criticism. When he heard the verses composed by Asma bint Marwan, he was infuriated and screamed aloud, Will no one rid me of this daughter of Marwan? That very night, a gang of his followers set out to do the dirty deed. They broke into the poet's house. She was lying in her bedroom, suckling her newborn child, while her other small children slept nearby. The Muslims tore the newborn infant off her breast and they stabbed her to death. After the murder, when the Muslims went to inform the Prophet of Islam, he said, You have done a service to Allah and his messenger. Her life was not worth even two goats. A month later, the distinguished and highly respected Abu Afaq, who was over a hundred years old and renowned for his sense of fairness, was killed brutally in the same manner as he slept. Once again, the Prophet of Islam had commented that morning, who will avenge me on this scoundrel? This shows us exactly how much the tolerant and peace-loving Muhammad respected life. His followers claim that Muhammad was extremely gentle and loved children. Indeed, the horrifying way he had Asma bint Marwan's five infants slaughtered certainly attests to this loving side of Muhammad. All the Jews were becoming increasingly dissatisfied and angered at the deeds of the Muslims. The Jewish tribes were peace-loving, hard-working tradespeople whose purpose in life was to earn a decent living through honest means and hard effort. They were perfectly content with the religion of their forefathers and had never anticipated that the man to whom they had given shelter so graciously would turn into the power-crazed monster who was now turning around to attack them. Muhammad was in the position to carry out his hidden ambitions, which became clear soon enough. With the utmost disregard for all human morality, ethics, or respect for a human life, the Prophet of Islam, systematically targeted and slaughtered the very Jews of Medina who had helped him when everyone else in Arabia was kicking him like a mad dog. He was motivated by these primary reasons. His fanatic greed for all the wealth that had been created by blood, sweat and toil of the Jews. Our listeners should be made aware that for most of his adult life, Muhammad was not employable and unemployed and hence coveted the wealth and produce of others. The Jews were the biggest obstacle in his plan to subject all of Medina so they had to be removed by any means possible. His fear of all other religions, Muhammad was a pathological narcissist, a delusional megalomaniac, meaning he believed that he was the supreme ruler of the world. Anything that threatened this sick fantasy of his had to be exterminated. Since the religion of the Jews rejected his pathetic claims to divine rule, they were the targeted victims in Medina, just as the polytheist Arabs had been his victims in Mecca. The incidents narrated below demonstrate the horrific depth of Muhammad's atrocities. Keep in mind that Muhammad is the model of good Islamic behavior, and you will realize how Muhammad and Islam advocate genocide in the name of their cult belief system. 4. The Siege of the Banu Qaynuqa, April 623 AD in the Medina. 
in order to get full control of the Medina, Muhammad needed to get rid of all his opponents. The strongest of these opponents was Abdullah ibn Ubay, a powerful chief who was allied with the Jewish tribe of Banu Qaynuqa. This tribe was also the weakest because they were made up of craftsmen, in particular goldsmiths. By attacking them, Muhammad knew he could plunder a huge amount of wealth and weaken Ibn Ubay. Muhammad needed an excuse to attack them, so he made the girl married to one of his followers pretend that she had been teased by the Jews. The Muslims blockaded the fort of the Banu Qaynuqa for 15 days until the starving Jews surrendered. Immediately, Muhammad was ready to kill them all, but Ibn Ubay seized hold of Muhammad and protested. Muhammad's face became black with rage as he shouted, Let go of me! But Ibn Ubay was adamant and shouted back, No, by Allah, I will not let you go until you deal kindly with my allies. 400 men without armor and 300 with, who have always supported me against enemies. And you want to slay them all in one morning? By Allah, if I were in your place, I would fear a reversal of fortune. At this threat, the cowardly Muhammad turned pale as he realized that all the people of Medina were against him. He hit Ibn Ubay on the face and ordered that the Jews be kicked out of their own homes. All their property was seized and looted. Many of the prettiest women were taken as prisoners to become sex slaves. Muhammad, as usual, kept one-fifth of the enormous booty for himself. This is the way he repaid the kindness of the Jews of Medina, who had given him shelter and refuge when Muhammad had run away from Mecca in fear. The revelations in the 8th surah of the Qur'an were clearly in reference to the Banu Qaynuqa and anyone who opposed the Muslims. Al-Anfal 8.55 Lo, the worst of beasts in Allah's sight are the ungrateful who will not believe. Those of them with whom you made a treaty and then at every opportunity they break their treaty and they keep not duty to Allah. If you come to them in the war, deal with them so as to strike fear in those who are behind them so that they may be remembered. Here, Muhammad's acts of planned terrorism against the Jewish tribe is justified by Allah because according to the merciful Allah, non-Muslims are the worst of beasts. So it is perfectly all right to murder, rape, torture, and pillage the non-believers. Not only that, but Allah is advising Muhammad and the Muslims that when anyone protests against the injustices committed by Muslims, the Muslims should make sure and deal with them with such violence that it will strike fear among anyone who may think of supporting dissent. This proves that the Quran is nothing but a political manual for controlling people with terror. Not even the fascist armies of Hitler engineered such devilish ideas. 5. The Battle of Uhud, 625 AD The people of Mecca were outraged at the massacre and the subsequent mutilation of their kinsmen in the Battle of Badr by Muhammad and his army. They had to fight back in order to defend themselves, so they gathered up an army and set out on the march to Medina. Muhammad set out with his motley crew of hundreds of pirates of the desert. When Muhammad tried forcing the Jews of Medina to join him, they adamantly refused, knowing fully well the true character of the tyrant. Muhammad and his men camped on the slopes of Mount Uhud above the camp of the Meccan army. With his usual insidious manner, Muhammad planned to attack before dawn as the Meccans were asleep. The Muslims were too incompetent to implement even this plan properly and ended up alerting the Meccans during the surprise attack. At this point, the Meccans gathered up their weapons and engaged the Muslims in full combat. Muhammad, as usual, cowered in the background, surrounded by his bunch of bodyguards. From time to time he would scream out, Who will become a martyr for Allah? And which of you will sell himself for us? Exhorting his army with promises of paradise if they fought for him. The Muslims, this time, however, were no match for the Meccans. Most of them started running for their lives by clambering up the sides of Mount Uhud, at which Muhammad started swearing like a madman. It was only by a stroke of good luck that Muhammad survived. His army was badly defeated and the people of Medina started asking that if this man was indeed a messenger of Allah, then why had Allah not given the Muslims victory? To make up for the extreme embarrassment of this defeat, Muhammad came up with more divine revelations that were obviously excuses for the thorough thrashing that his men and ego had suffered at Uhud. Muhammad 
was so obsessed with his own sense of self-importance that he made any action that went against his power a crime. Any Muslim who did not treat Muhammad like Allah would be punished severely. The third chapter of the Quran is full of these references to the battle of Uhud. Al-Imran 3.140 And if ye have received a blow, the disbelievers have received a blow the like thereof. These are the vicissitudes which we cause to follow one another for mankind, to the end that Allah may know those who believe and may choose witnesses from among you. Here Muhammad Allah is conveniently making excuses for the severe defeat of the Muslims by saying that although they suffered huge losses, the Meccans also suffered losses. In addition to this, Allah conveniently bails out Muhammad yet again by explaining away the total decimation of the Muslim army with the excuse that it was a trial for the Muslims. This surah also makes very clear the reason why Muslims everywhere bring nothing but death and destruction. The Allah of Islam is instructing his followers to prove their loyalty by going out and killing unbelievers, therefore legalizing murder and giving it divine sanction. And who are those unbelievers? Any innocent person who does not agree to Muhammad's twisted version of Islam. A belief system based upon such principles can only be embraced by people of the most inhumane, cruel and barbarous nature. Al-Imran 3.153 When you climb the hill and paid no heed while the messenger in your rear was calling you to fight, therefore he rewarded your grief for his grief. Here Muhammad is lashing out at the followers who dished him and ran up Mount Uhud for their lives. His ego is so deluded that in this surah he tells his followers that deserting the messenger is the same as deserting Allah. Muhammad, the slave of Allah, is thus equating himself with the supreme power itself. This is in reality one of the most despicable forms of blackmail that Muhammad used upon his followers. In short, they were told that anyone who doesn't protect Muhammad with his life will be punished by Allah in the form of his family and tribesmen being killed by divine will. 6. Murder of a Poet Among the Jewish tribe of Bani Nadir was an eminent poet by the name of Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. He was an extremely famous and cultured poet who was considered a genius of verse. He had composed a lament about the Quraishites who had been so unjustly massacred and mutilated in the Battle of Badr. One day, Muhammad proclaimed in his usual sweet manner, Who will rid me of the dog Kaab bin al-Ashraf? A certain Muhammad bin Maslama replied that he would do it, adding, We shall have to tell lies to do it. Inevitably, Muhammad immediately gave the divine authority to lie as necessary. Needless to say, as usual, after dark, Kaab was dragged out of his bed screaming and stabbed repeatedly by Muhammad Maslama and three other devout Muslims in full view of his young wife-to-be. Muhammad and Islam triumphs once again. 7. Invasion of Bani Nadir, June 625 AD The Jewish tribe of Bani Nadir was outraged at the assassination of the greatest poet Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. The fact that one of the greatest literary figures of their tribe had been mercilessly murdered simply because he wrote some words that criticized Muhammad was a cause of immense rage. The sight of the wealth possessed by the Bani Nadir whipped up a frenzy of jealousy inside Muhammad. Using his usual methodology of subterfuge and deception, Muhammad claimed that Allah had revealed to him that the Bani Nadir were hatching a plot to assassinate him. The Nadir were amazed when out of the blue, a Muslim messenger arrived at their oasis with the message from Muhammad. The message was worded in the usual brutal manner, leave my city and live here no longer after the treason which you have plotted against me. The Nadir, being mere civilians, decided the best thing to do was to shut themselves up in their homes and prepare to defend themselves. Immediately, Muhammad surrounded them with his army of murderers and sat down outside, protected by his usual bunch of bodyguards. When the Nadir made no move to fight, the merciful Muhammad started cutting down every single palm tree in the oasis. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember that in a desert environment like Arabia, this act was equivalent to mass murder, considering how hard it was to grow food. The Nadir could not bear to see their oasis destroyed so mercilessly and came out to surrender. Muhammad, who was still cowering behind his bodyguards, screamed out, 
leave this place, you have your lives. The peace-loving tribe, which had carefully tended their land and made it the oasis that it was, after centuries of hard work, were thrown out at sword point and stripped of all their belongings. They had to flee for their lives to Khaybar, another Jewish settlement, which in a future course would also be destroyed by the Apostle of Peace. All the rich booty and the land was grabbed by the plundering Muslims, but the largest amount of land and most of the loot went, as always, to the epitome of fair play and justice, Muhammad. As usual, a torrent of made-to-order divine revelations followed. Al-Hashr 59.2 He it is who hath caused those of the people of Scripture, Jews, who disbelieved to go forth from their homes unto the first exile. You deemed not that they should go forth, while they deemed that their strongholds would protect them from Allah. That is because they were opposed to Allah and his messenger. Whatsoever palm trees you cut down or left standing on their roots, it was by Allah's leave, in order that he might confound the evil livers. Once again, the most compassionate and merciful Allah comes to Muhammad's rescue and declares that all the crimes and atrocities that were committed against the innocent Bani Nadir were justified by the divine word of the all-merciful Allah. Not only that, but Allah decrees that the Jews deserved to be thrown out of their homeland simply because 1. They were not Muslim 2. They were opposed to Muhammad The fact that he mercilessly assassinated their innocent point for daring to criticize him is ignored 3. They were on prime land and had a huge amount of wealth which Muhammad lusted for Over and above this, cutting down palm trees was considered a capital crime by the Arabs so Muhammad had to have Allah give him a nice and tidy excuse for having committed this atrocity. Lastly, Muhammad is making it very clear here as to who is the boss. If anyone opposed Muhammad, it meant he opposed Allah and all Muslims had to kill anyone who opposed Allah. So the final equation remained the same. Muhammad and Allah are on the same footing. Again, we have come a full circle to the fundamental and central guiding principles of Muhammad and Islam, intolerance, hatred, murder, and brutality. 8. Murder of an elder from Khaybar, 626 AD. The Muslims who had assassinated Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, the famous poet of the Bani Nadir, were considered as heroes by Muhammad and his followers. Murderers were considered as ideal Muslims. To prove their loyalty to their prophet also, a group of Muslims from the Khazraj tribe decided killing off a respectable member of the Jewish community, Abu Rafi. He was an elderly man who had never done anything against Muhammad or the Muslims. He just happened to be the unfortunate target of Muhammad's plot to terrorize the Jews. Muhammad sent an expedition of six men who broke into the old man's house in the middle of the night and slashed him to ribbons as he slept. The cowardly Muslims always assassinated people in this way while the victim slept, obviously because they had neither the courage nor the strength to fight even a solitary aged Jewish man while he was awake. After their crime, the Muslims fled back home into the arms of their expectant prophet. There was a quarrel among them as to who had actually killed Abu Rafi. At this, Muhammad smiled beatifically and started checking their swords. Finally, it was decided that the person who owned the sword which still had traces of food on it, was the winner. Apparently, Abu Rafi had just finished his dinner before falling asleep and the sword had slashed through his stomach, spilling its contents. Once more, with commendable bravery against great odds, Muhammadan Muslims defended themselves and their prophet. 9. Massacre, Rape and Plunder of Bani al-Mustaliq December 626 AD Muhammad attacked the Bani Mustaliq because of their wealth. In a surprise raid, the Muslims drove them to the sea. They slaughtered many members of the Bani Mustalak tribe and looted away a booty of 2,000 camels, 5,000 sheep, and 500 women. 500 women were captured screaming and crying after they had watched their husbands and sons being slaughtered. The most beautiful captive was Juwayriya, daughter of the chief of the Bani Mustalak. Muhammad snatched her to satisfy his own lust. The captured women were supposed to be returned by the Muslims upon payment of a ransom. But the night after the battle itself, Muhammad and his army raped each and every one of them. One of the men, 
Abu Sa'id Khudri of Muhammad's army reported, we were lusting after women and chastity had become too hard for us, but we wanted to get the ransom money for our prisoners. So we wanted to use the azl, coitus interruptus, where the man withdraws before ejaculating. We asked the Prophet about it and he said, you are not under any obligation to stop yourselves from doing it like that. Later on, the women and children were given for ransom to their envoys. They all went away to their country and not one wanted to stay, although they had the choice. So the peace-loving Muhammad told his men it was perfectly fine to rape women as long as you don't ejaculate inside them, which would make them pregnant. What supreme logic! Any human being with the slightest shred of morality has to be nauseated by this man and the cult that he preached. Muhammad, the perfect figurehead of Islam, sanctions rape, pure and simple. Not only did the Muslims commit this horrifying crime, they deceived the tribesmen into paying ransom for their women folk, who only paid the money in a desperate attempt to save their women's honor. To call such a leader and his followers the epitome of evil is probably an understatement. 10. The last Jewish tribe left in Medina, the Banu Quraidah. By this time, Muhammad had murdered or driven out all of the Jewish tribes of Medina except them. It was time to eliminate this last stone in his flesh. Bani Quraidah had been reluctant in helping Muhammad against the Quraysh. Conveniently, once again, Muhammad claimed that he had divine knowledge about a conspiracy by them to kill him. He besieged their fortress for 25 days. When the starving tribe surrendered, Muhammad forced an old man from their own tribe to pronounce Muhammad's sentence. The sentence was death to every male member of the tribe slavery for every woman and child, and plunder of all their property. The Prophet had an immense trench dug around the main market of Medina. The men and boys of the Banu Quraidah were rounded up and their hands twisted tightly behind them. Then one by one, they were shoved to the edge of the trench and forced to kneel. They were offered the last chance to convert to the true faith, and if they refused, had their heads chopped off. As soon as one head rolled off, the corpse would be kicked into the ditch, and so it went. By the time dawn had colored the sky red in Medina, hundreds of corpses had piled up in a heap in a tangled cesspool of blood, hair, and shreds of flesh. Despite the horrific end, in front of their eyes, none of the Jews chose to convert to Islam and face death valiantly. The blood of 900 innocent Jews stained Muhammad's hands on that black day. Their only crime was that they chose to retain their fundamental human right of choosing their own God and the religion of their ancestors. Hysterical women and children screamed as they watched their fathers, husbands and sons die. The majority of them were raped savagely and then bundled off to be sold as used goods. Muhammad had the husband of the Jewish Rayhana bint Amr hacked to pieces before her very eyes, hours after he had murdered her father. No doubt, this was Muhammad's perverted version of a wedding present, because after these atrocities, he raped the mortified girl and tried to force her to convert to Islam. Muhammad and historians still describe the savage rape of Rayhana bint Amr as her willing submission to Islam and wifehood to the Prophet. Apparently, according to them, it is very natural to imagine that a woman who had just seen her husband, father, brothers, and the tribe slaughtered violently before her very eyes would choose to convert to the religion of the murderer and marry him. In actual fact, Raihana refused to convert to Islam and also refused to marry Muhammad, the murderer of her family. He kept her as a lowly concubine all his life. So much for the apostle of peace and his unbounded respect for women. Muhammad was nothing but a predator upon females, a serial rapist who acquired his victims by killing their families first. Allah, as usual, has provided yet another timeless divine revelation which gives his prophet the right to rape and molest women of other religions. An Nisa 4.24 And all married women are forbidden unto you except those captives whom your right hand possesses. It is a decree of Allah for you. In short, Allah, the merciful and compassionate, is saying, Hey Muslims, it's a crime to go after married women, but if they happen to be your captives, which obviously all the non-Muslim women were, 
feel free to indulge yourself in rape and sexual torture of them. Lawful unto you are all beyond those mentioned. Allah is making it legal for Muslims to go ahead and rape non-Muslim women by divine law. One shudders to imagine what kind of minds invented such utterly sadistic, disgusting and ungodly ideas. Muhammad justified all his crimes against the Jews with more of Allah's revelations. Although the following surahs were not revealed at the same time as the massacre of Bani Quraidah, they nevertheless give a general idea of Muhammad's views on Jews and why it is perfectly fine to kill, loot and rape them. Al-Ma'idah 5.51 O you who believe, take not the Jews and Christians for friends. They are friends one to another. He among you who taketh them for friends is one of them. Above verse clearly demonstrates the Muslims' hatred of Jews and Christians as prescribed by their Prophet. They also expose the hollow claims of Muhammadans that Islam is a peaceful religion that always coexisted with Judaism and Christianity. The innumerable unwarranted massacres of Jews by Muhammad tell the story in the clearest terms. These historical events form the basis of the Islamic code of behavior. Therefore, the genocide of Hindus, Christians and Jews by Muslims all over the world should come as no surprise whatsoever. Even after the passage of 1400 years, in this 21st century, the fundamentalist followers of Muhammad are more than happy and willing to drag the whole of humanity into the abyss and depraved cult of Muhammad using Muhammad's methodologies of lies, deception, terror, hate, discrimination and slaughter to obtain their agenda. They cannot change because their Quran and Muhammad's Sunnah prohibit them from ever getting rid of the virus that has infected their brain. It is up to the remainder 80% of humanity, the so-called unbelievers, to quarantine them, re-educate them, and using all the instruments of our laws to deal with those amongst us who want to harm us.